Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! So I would like to um, start the introduction by giving an absolutely classic joke um, about a bar. Uh, Schrodinger's cat walks into a bar and doesn't. So it's a privilege to um, introduce David Wineland, um, who not only has a Nobel Prize, but whose supervisor For his PhD, Norman Ramsey had a Nobel Prize, and his postdoc supervisor, Hans Demelt, had a Nobel Prize as well. So with that pedigree and his present work at the National Institute um, of Standards and Technology, let me introduce him and say, let's go. So thanks very much for the introduction and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I have to say I, I'm not going to be able to teach you very much about quantum computers here this afternoon, but at least try to maybe give you a flavor why we think it's interesting. Is it okay? Uh, yes, just bring it right up to Okay. Okay. So just to summarize briefly what I'll talk about, um, excuse me one sec. Uh, it, I'll try to give you an idea why this idea of quantum computers might be interesting. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about the weird features that we play on to, to realize this kind of device. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make a comparison to, to Schrodinger's cat because I think this basically we're making a kind of a more humane version of Schrodinger's cat if we can build this device. I'll say a little bit about how we manipulate states and what I'm going to do, it's, it's by now a large field and I'm going to, I'm going to give you the example of the, the kind of work that I'm familiar with, with what our lab does, which uses trapped atomic ions to realize the elements, but there's a lot of commonality between all the platforms. And I'll come back in the end and say why I think quantum computers are very much like Schrodinger's cat. So one way to motivate the subject is that uh, there's a, what's called Moore's law. It's not really a law. It's a trend in computers which says that the number, basically the number of transistors on a microprocessor 
uh, doubles every year and a half or so. And this, what this graph is intended to represent that basically the, these are you know, many processors over the years and it does hold to this, this trend of doubling every year and a half. Uh, so one thing, one way to, to think about how this works is that it, it processors stay about the same size and uh, not very long from now, if, it, if the trend computer, uh, trend, the trend c continues, uh, we'll reach the size of transistors down to the, to the size of atoms. And so we then, at that point, quantum effects become manifest and maybe we can take advantages of those effects rather than it being a problem. So very non-technical view of things, this idea, it, it, quantum computing plays a crucial part is superposition, and uh, I, I like this, this, this simple example, which uh, to me gives the idea of superposition and also measurement in quantum systems. And if you look at the, the box here in the upper right corner, at some instance of time, you might see this face here be in the foreground, and at other times you might see this face here be in the, in the foreground. And Yet this image up here seems to carries both properties, both states of the uh, of system at, at, uh, at the same time. Uh, the other thing is when you, if you look at this image here, occasionally you will see one or the other face being in the foreground, and that's very much like quantum measurement. We'd say the system collapses or projections projects into one condition, one state, or the other. Oh. So let me say a little, be a little more specific now about some of the, how you can get an idea why this idea might be interesting. Uh, so based in, our, in our normal uh, laptops and iPads and things like that, the uh, all, basically all information, as you know, is stored in binary form. So each bit can either hold the value of zero or one, but if we can make uh, quantum superpositions, and what I've done here is written the, the typical notation for a wave function where it's a superposition uh, between zero and one. It's neither uh, zero or one, it's, it's zero and one at the same time. So one way you can start to appreciate well, how this might be interesting is that, for example, if we have a three-bit register in our normal computers that stores one three-bit binary number, for example, 101. But in this superposition, a three-bit quantum register could store all possible uh, uh, configurations of bits at the same time, and this is an example of, the, of a superposition uh, that does that. So this represents that there's eight possible states here, or, or eight states that it can store simultaneously. Uh, so this is eight or two to the three, and it's an ex example of exponential scaling. And a dramatic, whoops, uh, excuse me, a dramatic example is if we had uh, just 300 quantum bits, we could store uh, two to the 300, about 10 to the 90th numbers simultaneously, and this is more elementary particles in the universe. So in this superposition sense, we have this ability for massive uh, memory storage. There's also the, the situation that this wave function that represents the, uh, the, the state of our, our register. Uh, in general, the coefficients, which as the physicists know, represents the strength of, for example, in, the, our, in, our, in, our, uh, in this example here, the coefficient alpha zero, uh, its magnitude squared represents the 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 zero 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 ness of this quantum register, you might say. Uh, so, but of course, a, a rule we have to obey is that we can actually make states like this, and in fact, we can actually make states that out of three hundred qubits like this uh, uh, to do something interesting is is the challenge, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but. But anyway, the, the, the rule we have to live with, for example, even with a single bit, when we do a measurement on the system, it's going to collapse or, or project into one state or the other, where given by, the, again, the amplitudes 
squared, the, which represent the probability. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there are certain algorithms where we can live with that limitation. And the most famous example probably is Peter Shore, a computer theorist, who came up with an algorithm in the mid-90s uh, where he showed that if you could make this quantum computing di device, you can efficiently factorize large numbers. And I think most of you know the most, almost all encryption that's done these days, it drives its security from the inability, inability to factorize, efficiently factorize large numbers. So obviously, this is important for governments uh, that want to transfer secrets, and also important to you too when you buy th things on the uh, things over the web. You typically use an encryption uh, an, uh, algorithm that would be compromised by the by the if someone had a quantum computer. Uh, so actually, to to try to demystify it a little bit, I'll say a little more. In fact, that when we think about at least. The most, one of the most conventional ways to think about how we would do a, a quantum computation is that is, can be compared to how we might think about computation works in a normal computer. So in our, in our normal computers, although it may not be the most efficient way, we can actually do what's called universal computation, that is any, any computation you might think of with just two, uh, two gates and, uh, for example, a bit flip and an example, another example would be an AND gate. It could be some other two-bit two gate. But the idea is that, you, that all you need are these two ingredients in principle to do any computation. There's an analogy in the, in the quantum world where we, we want, we, we want a, a little bit uh, something different, and that is instead of just bit flips, we want, for example, uh, be able to make make uh, superposition states that look like this, uh, a more general thing than a bit flip. And I've represented the bits by arrows being up or down here, because what you can think of is like, a, as in NMR, if you have a spin one half particle, you can, the, the spin can be pointing, pointing up or down, and we can make superposition states by driving the, a transition between up and down at some intermediate time. The other ingredient we, uh, need is again a two bit, two qubit logic gate, and the truth table might look like this. Here's the so called controlled knot where the first bit, if it's a zero, nothing happens to the second bit. If it's a, if first bit is a one, the, the second bit flips. And of course, we can make a classical gate that, that, that implements as well. But the trick is uh, for the quantum computing is we, we want to make we want to implement this gate in a way such that it'll work on superpositions. And for example, if we have two, two quantum bits in, the, in an equal superposition state, and if we apply this operator, we end up with uh, this wave function here. And now it, it has the property that our input is, is a product of two, this, the, the uh, wave functions from two uh, separate qubits, but we can no longer write it as a, as a product. It's, uh, that is, when we measure one bit, it dip, the outcome of the measurement on the second bit depends on what we got for the first measurement, and this is, this is generally called entanglement. And again, I, you know, people, people take in universities will spend, a, a teach semester-long courses to talk about Shor's algorithm and and related things, and so I can only give you a, a, a very brief impression of, of the idea. So, so uh, uh, in a very simplistic term, Shor's algorithm, uh, you start with a you start with a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a a quantum state which is actually an equal superposition. Uh, say for three quantum bits, it would be it would look like this. Uh, we need, in general, of course, we want to work with a lot more bits, but this, that's the basic idea. So we plug that into our register, and uh, then basically we, we need to apply a series of these, what we call rotations, uh, and, and also these two qubit operations. So it's very, the programming we do is very much like line programming in C or Fortran. That, it, it's very straightforward, but again, the, it's, it now has to be able to work on, 
on superposition states of our quantum bits. And what you can, like, what you can liken to in a very simple sense uh, that is what Shor's algorithm does. It, 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 it's very much like Young's slid in experiment, experiment that we learn from classical mechanics, water waves, and also uh, Young's slit experiments for photons. And uh, basically the idea is in, in, for water waves, we know how the, the when, if we transmit the, uh, an, a uh, water wave that's, that's impinging on this target, if it has holes in it, then the part of the water wa waves go through and we get, oops, we get, oh, sorry, we get these troughs uh, troughs and valley, uh, pardon me, the peaks and valleys of the of the interference pattern, and and in fact, what what Shor's algorithm does with these series of operations is like a giant uh, version of this interference. Uh, the, these operations, which all act on the system ideally coherently, they interfere the amplitudes in some complicated way, so that in the end, before we measure the system, we we end up with an output wave function, which is, is formed from part of the states we've plugged in. It turns out it still can be a fairly large number, but vastly less than uh, the number of states we plugged in. And then when we do our final measurement, Schur's algorithm is such that you, whatever your register projects to, this binary register, which is a classical output now, you can use that in, a, in a number theory algorithms too extract the factors. To set the scale of what's interesting for this factorizing problem, uh, for example, to factorize a 150 digit decimal number requires about 10 to the nine operations and many thousands of, uh, of quantum, quantum bits. Uh, these days, the, the best experiment, the most advanced experiments can maybe uh, uh, it, to operate maybe with hundreds of, or carry out hundreds of operations and a handful of qubit, maybe tens up to 30 or 40 qubits. So, so we're very far away from this goal right now, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> with the work proceeds ahead. So let me talk a little bit about Schrodinger's cat. But, uh, and I think certainly most of the physicists know what this is about. The, uh, Schrodinger, who was one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, his version was wave mechanics, which is how we like to think our, about our quantum computers. Uh, he, he was, I mean, he and the other founding fathers and people like Einstein and Bohr, they would sit around and they, they, they could envision how this idea, this quantum mechanics would work on sim simple systems like, uh, you know, group, small groups of atoms and so on. Uh, but Schrodinger was bothered by the fact that, in principle, this wave mechanics should apply to, to very large-scale systems, and his, he, he was nervous about that. And his way to, to express that was he, he, he uh, dreamt up this example that, in principle, he said the idea is you put a, a cat inside a box, and we say it's sealed, that is, it can't interact with outside environment to perturb what's inside the box. But anyway, we put this cat inside the box. Uh, we put a, some poison here and a single radioactive uh, particle. So the idea is if, it, if the particle decays, it releases the poison and kills the cat. And in principle, we, you know, we'd be totally impractical, but in principle we could write down the, the, the wave equation, the Schrodinger equation that describes this situation. And all we can say from that is that the, after a, a time equal the half-life of the radioactive particle where it has 50% probability of decaying, all we can say is that inside the box is this, whoops, is this superposition state uh, where, the, where the, the particle has not decayed, the cat is alive, and simultaneously the particle has decayed and, and the cat is dead. So this is, this is the problem, but uh, you'll, yeah, and I think this, I think physicists still struggle with this issue that, you know, why, we know practical reasons why we can't build a system as large as a cat, but there doesn't appear to be any, prin in principle, reason why we can't build larger and larger systems that are, that are like this cat. So we, actually, Schrodinger was bothered by this throughout his career, and he, he, in one of his papers in the early 50s, he says, 
He says, well, we, we, in fact, although he and the founding fathers would sit around and think about how this applied to simple systems, like single uh, electrons, atoms, or molecules, he says, in thought experiments we, we sometimes do, but this invariably leads to ridiculous consequences. And I think what he meant here, it'd be interesting to ask him, but I think what he meant was that, you know, by thinking of, by trying to extrapolate these simple examples of superposition and entanglement, it leads to things like Schrodinger's cat. We never see situations like Schrodinger's cat. So, but in fact, this excuse won't work, but, but now we in many, many groups around the world can play with these single quantum systems. And in fact, the, the, you know, we're starting to build up to not anything near a cat, but the small, we build larger and larger systems. Uh, and basically, you know, the technical problems, we need to control things very precisely. And we do need the isolation from the, the environment, any, any outside perturbing effects. Uh, and I, I'm going to give some examples from the, the group of our work at NIST in Boulder, Colorado, but uh, by no means, uh, you know, there's, I, and I will say a little bit more at the end, there's many groups using uh, not just atoms or ions as we're using, but other quantum systems to try to realize these things. So let me say a little bit what, what we do. So what, in the very simplest form, we... Uh, one of our experiments, we use mercury atomic ions, and uh, we can build a device. This is the, a very simple form of the kind of device we can make. Is that it's a, a simple electrode structure. To, typical dimensions might be a mil, millimeter or less. And we can, we use a, I won't explain the exact tramping mechanism, but it's a combination, we apply a combination of static and oscillating electric fields to this three electrode structure. What you can think of is it, it basically, it forms a three dimensional harmonic well. Um, in a, even simpler terms, it's like having a marble in a bowl and this marble can, can roll back and forth. Uh, one of the things we can do, Bill Phillips in his talk on Tuesday evening talked about uh, laser cooling. It turns out we will want to make our uh, the, the, the freeze out the motion as best we can. Uh, the, we start with a simple form of what Bill described on Monday, uh, Doppler laser cooling. And for the, for the, well, <laughs> for this, for the situation we have, uh, the, the simple form of, of the theory of Doppler cooling applies. That is where we can think about the, the laser interacting only with two of the the levels. Anyway, in that, in that limit, we get down to temperatures, uh, effective temperatures of about a millikelvin. Averaged over time, even for a single ion, the distribution of energy looks, looks thermal. That's why we can talk about uh, a, a temperature. Uh, typically with ions, the, wave, the wavelengths are in the ultraviolet or near ultraviolet. So we need, that's one of the challenges in these kind of experiments we need to to, to, to make narrowband ultraviolet sources. Uh, and to see what's going on, in fact, we can actually make pictures, in this case with an ultraviolet sensitive uh, uh, camera, we can actually see a, a single ion inside this, this trap, we say. Uh, so let me give you, I, I won't, I'm not gonna talk about atomic clocks, but when, a, when we started this work, one of our main interests was to try to make a, a, a better atomic clock with, uh, with uh, in this case, trapped ions. It could be neutral atoms, which are many people work on these days. Anyway, the, uh, the, one of the transition what, that was interesting to us was this other near ultraviolet transition. And uh, anyway, this this started this work started in '81 and in uh, mid 2000s. Uh, uh, we finally got to the point, uh, this, this work was led by Jim Burquist in our lab, and we finally got to the point where we, we could show that the uncertainties, the systematic uncertainties of the experiments were, were smaller than the best cesium standards. And these days now, all the standards labs talk about making optical clocks because the, the accuracies are, are better than, it's, it's easier to achieve accuracies better than the, the cesium clocks now. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, well, anyway, so we, with this simple system, of, uh, that's the most, I'm gonna, I'll say a little bit more clocks in the end, but the, the, uh, 
Uh, anyway, coming back to the simple picture of our atomic marble in the bowl, one of the things we can do just as kind of a demonstration is we can, one kind of uh, superposition we can state is we, we can start with our atom and we can make it go back and forth in the bowl uh, uh, just as a marble would. Uh, but never, we can also at certain instances of time make a, make, make a situation where the, the, the mercury uh, at atomic marble is both on the left side of the bowl and the right side of the bowl at the same time. So this is, this is kind of, I mean, this makes no sense in our ordin classic, classical ordinary day experience, but this is the kind of world we live in. And for the physicists out there, I, I, should, I should say this is just maybe a little more graphic uh, a demonstration, but it's entirely analogous to, to Young's two-slit experiment with single photons that where they, in that case you think about the, the photon going through both slits at the same time. Uh, but what's going to be more interesting for this idea of quantum computing is we're going to uh, we, we're going to be mostly considered with the uh, internal states of the uh, of our ions in, in our case and we can say take the ground state and some excited state and we can make superposition states we can make a qubit based on those two energy levels. Um, so, for example, one this was interesting for clocks. The this 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 uh, particular transition from this S to D level, uh, it, it, the 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 decay rate is very slow. It's about a tenth of a second, uh, and most of our experiments, at least our quantum experiments, take less than a millisecond. Took so a pretty good approximation. This this. Uh, uh, this is infinitely uh, long-lived. In any case, what we can do is we can make superpositions. We can start the atom in the ground state, apply this radiation on resonance for a certain amount of time, and we can make then uh, superpositions that look like that. Looks like that. One of the nice things with the in the, in the atom or the atom or either neutral or ion experiments, so we have a nice way to detect. Uh, and that is, and the example of that in the Mercury case is that if we've made this superposition, uh, then what we can do is we can turn on this laser that does the cooling and scatters the light. Uh, so in this example here, we've taken this superposition, projected it into the zero state, we scatter light, and we can detect enough of that to, to tell that it's been projected into this zero state. On the other hand, if we take the same state and uh, with certain probability it will be projected into one state, and in that case there's no scattered light, uh, and we can easily distinguish those two cases, so we can e detect with extremely high probability which state the, the, the atom is in. There's one more other thing we're gonna need before I say how we can try to implement these ideas of quantum computing with our atomic ions. I've, I've, I've talked a little, mentioned a little bit about laser cooling, uh, in fact, for these experiments, we want to absolutely freeze out the motion, uh, only limited by the fundamental limits of quantum mechanics. And I've so far talked about this simple classical picture of the mar marble rolling back and forth in the bowl, uh, but we know from quantum mechanics this harmonic oscillator at, 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 in the quantum, at the quantum level is actually composed of a discrete uh, number of uh, a, a, a discrete energy spectrum, and so what this, what these these energy states of the harmonic oscillator, the separation is given by the in term, is given by the oscillation frequency times Planck's constant, and the only thing that where the technical difficulty comes in is this, these the the energy splittings here are about a billion times smaller than these optical uh, energy splittings. Uh, so one thing to get into, so we wanted to get down to this very lowest uh, uh, energy state, the ground state of motion as kind of a fiducial starting point for any of the things we do. And it turns out we, have, we can do something which is almost trivially simple or a little bit more complicated than what I'll say, but the basic idea is if the atom starts in its lowest electronic state, uh, it, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, if, it, if it starts in its lowest electronic state uh, for any given uh, motional state that it might be in, we can actually drive a transition where, it, say in this case, it's the second motional state, 
we can actually drive a transition while driving the electronic transition where the motional state is reduced by one quantum. And it turns out for the conditions we can, we can achieve, we need fairly strong binding of, the, of our atomic marble inside this bowl. We can achieve conditions such that with very prob high probability, when the atom decays, it decays without changing the, this motional quantum level. And so the idea of, uh, of this cooling to get to the ground state is very straightforward. We just leave this laser on, and it, as it spontaneous em spontaneously emits, it walks down this ladder of states, and then uh, it finally reaches the ground state, which is the, is the interesting state for the start of our experiments. Uh, so this was kind of the next version of laser cooling we need to achieve in these experiments, that it was cooling to this motional ground state. Uh, so in uh, about the time of Shor's algorithm, mid in the mid-90s, uh, there was an atomic physics experiment, actually and funded in part by IUPAP, uh, the, the, the International Conference on, uh, on Atomic Physics. Uh, and anyway, uh, we, we invited uh, uh, a, a person, we, did, we, we, we didn't, uh, wasn't really able to get Peter Shor to come, but we got Arthur Eckert, who's a, who's an expert in these ideas of quantum computing to come and give a, a lecture to the, the atomic physicists there. And two of our, our well-known favorite quantum optician theorists in atomic physics are Ignacio Serac and Peter Zoller. They were at this meeting, and the, after they heard the ideas that Arthur Eckert presented about Shor's algorithm and so on, uh, they, they came up, they knew, they, one, of, one of their strengths is that they're not only good theorists, but they are also very aware of what experiments can do and what can't do. And anyway, they came up with an idea uh, based on this idea of, of uh, atomic ions. So this structure, electrode structure here doesn't look like what I showed before, but again, you can think of it uh, as providing a, a three-dimensional harmonic well for ions, in this case, an example of five ions. The, the, in in this, this configuration here of the electrodes, we, we make the well along this horizontal direction relatively weak to the confining wells in the transverse direction. So if we put cold ions into this, into this three-dimensional well, uh, they all want to fall to the bottom of the well, but they, the Coulomb repulsion holds them apart in some regular array. And uh, you can think of this, this kind of arrangement of five atoms, this charged atoms, as kind of like a pseudomolecule. So it has, just like the vibration modes in a, in a normal molecule, it has three times five, three times the number of, mo uh, uh, pardon me, three times the number of, of ions uh, uh, modes in this thing. And you can think about th these modes uh, as uh, we can address those modes. So, what we, what we do is we, using the same ideas for this ground state cooling I just described, we can cool eat all the modes to the very lowest energy state. So the starting state of an operation, say, a, the, 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 the hard part for all of the experiments, not just for atoms and ions, but for all the platforms, is how to make a good quant a two qubit quantum gate. And so anyway, what you can think of is in general, uh, during a calculation, let's say the, the ends will be in some entangled superpositions. So the, the, their idea was that you, you first freeze out the motion, just as we did for the single mercury ion. Uh, we put, put all, the, the, all the modes of motion in the ground state. Uh, then because of the separation of the ions in this linear array, we can focus a, a laser beam on the first ion and we can transfer the superposition that was in this atomic state into a superposition of the ground and first excited state of motion. Uh, so that's the first step, and I'll come back to this in a second to give you a little better idea of what we actually do. Uh, and then the second step is if you can somehow, this, in general, this ion is gonna be, have its internal state, and if you can somehow do a quantum gate, uh, logic gate between the internal state of this ion and the, what this superposition of the emotional state, effectively you've done a logic operation between this ion and the second ion through the first mapping uh, step. And then the final step is you unmap the motion back into this ion here. Uh, so anyway, just to give you a little bit more detail, 
in fact, the, 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 the ideas that we can use are very similar to how we did the ground state cooling. Uh, so again, this first step in general, the, the, this qubit is going to start in a superposition of these two states, and the motion is in the, in the, in the ground state. So this mapping step we talked about is actually, that's one of the easier parts we can do is we, we use the same idea we, we did in the, in the cooling, and that is we can take a laser and we can drive this amplitude down to the lower electronic state, uh, and basically that carries out this operation where we map the superposition that was in this ion, internal state into the motional state superposition of the first two energy states of motion of this mode. And then the second step, it's a bit more complicated, but I'll, I, I'm going to simplify it, but at least gives the flavor of how this logic gate works. And so the idea is I'm going to take a part of the truth table and uh, say that, for example, we, the, in, this, in this example of, the, uh, of this logic gate, the, the motion quantum bit is, is going to be the control bit and the internal uh, uh, energy levels will be the target bit qubit in this two qubit logic gate. And so the idea is, for example, for the, to carry out the, the first part, the first line of this truth table, if the motion is in the, in the first excited state, we want to invoke a bit flip. And we can do that again, just reverse of what we did for the laser cooling. Uh, we can, we can excite the, the uh, ion up to this state here by tuning the frequency appropriately. On the other hand, if the control bit, the motion, is in the ground state, then when we, when we shine the laser on this, on this second ion, in fact, there's no place for it to go. So this, nothing happens to the, to the state. And so the, 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 the internal state of this ion remains in the ground state. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but this, this is the basic idea where we have this sort of, con we can invoke this conditional dynamics to carry about this state-dependent uh, bit flips. In fact, we were, we were already thinking about uh, these experiments um, and, and when we heard this talk and, uh, by, uh, or pardon me, when uh, Ignacio Sorak and Peter Zeller gave us a copy of their paper, we had been thinking about, I won't say much about this uh, or really anything about it, but we can, we can, with entangled states, we can prove the the, the fundamental signal to noise in spectroscopy, and we were we were trying to head towards that idea. But anyway, when their when their paper came along, we could immediately jump on this. And uh, uh, the person who led this project in our group, he was Chris Monroe. He, he was a first a postdoc and then a permanent member. He now has his gr uh, his own group at University of Maryland, where Bill Phillips is. Uh, anyway, we could we could jump on this idea and. and and demonstrate this, this first logic gate between sort of individual quantum bits. So then, a lot, leaving out a lot of details, I'm not going to talk really about algorithms. It, 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 takes, uh, it takes quite a bit of time to cover the kind of things we and other people are doing. Uh, but one thing that, then one part of the project that all these people, all of us thinking about quantum computation is we also have to look ahead and face how we might scale up. So one way we might do that with our atomic ions is, uh, is we make an electrode structure. This doesn't look at all like uh, what I showed you in the cartoons, but it turns out this is, this is a structure where all the electrodes are in the plane of the, of the figure here, and each little box, well, <laughs> really having trouble here. Each little box, uh, in this, in this diagram represents a trap that was like the one I showed in the, in the last segment. And there's many of these boxes around. So our, our idea for scaling up is that when we, we want to be able to, as we do this line programming, the steps of these two qubit and single bit uh, 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 operations, we want the gates when we want to make a gate between two, two of our qubits, we, can apply control electrodes uh, to these various, uh, uh, control voltages to these various electrodes, and we can move around, we can separate ions, move the two that we want uh, to do the logic gate, and bring them together 
and then, and then uh, do the logic aid and then move them off to other locations to do the next operations. And actually, we're lucky at, in, our, in our group in uh, NIST Boulder, the people that do Josephson junctions and microelectronics, they, they have all these fabrication facilities so that our students and postdocs can make these uh, devices here. We called this a racetrack for obvious reasons, and it has on, on the order of 100 or so uh, separate zones. Uh, okay, so just, just as I said earlier, we're, we're just one of many groups, and just to give you an idea how big the field is now, these, I list, and I'm sure this is probably not up to date, but I list in this view group just the groups uh, that are working on atomic ion implementations of these ideas around the world. So it's, it's a huge enterprise by now, uh, and this is just to show you how, how, how much interest there is around the world in these ideas. And there's, and there's many other platforms. Uh, there's certainly neutral atoms are a viable thing. They're manipulated in different ways. But, and then uh, there's Joseph and John. I think this was, this was mentioned a little bit yesterday, these other uh, condensed matter uh, uh, implementations. Uh, the one that's gotten the most traction over the last decade is uh, quantum bits based on Joseph's injunctions. Uh, I'll just say it just briefly a little bit about that. These are, uh, these are many of the groups uh, uh, working on Joseph's injunctions as quantum bits. And again, I'm with apologies, I'm sure I'm missing some newer groups there. But the idea is not, it turns out that what's done is these Joseph's injunctions, they, they, they can be uh, configured in such a way that they mimic uh, an atom. That is, that we can isolate two energy levels in these Joseph's injunctions devices. And you can think of that very much like the two energy levels we use in our atomic ions. And, and it turns out that the gates are implemented in a way that's actually fairly analogous to what I've talked about with the atomic ions. And that is that. Uh, they, they, we use the harmonic oscillator associated with motion to, to couple the ions, the internal states of the ions, as I mentioned. In this case, they also use harmonic oscillator. In this case, it's the harmonic oscillator associated with the modes, uh, electromagnetic modes in these strip line uh, waveguides uh, to couple these, these quantum bits uh, together. So the, they, you know, there's a lot of commonality here, and in fact, one of the nice things about the field for most of us, we get to learn a lot about other fields because there's a lot of, because there is this commonality. There's other possibilities. This was also mentioned yesterday, but uh, these two-dimensional electron gases uh, where you think about a planar structure and uh, electrons can be brought into these structures to uh, one, one way is to, say, bring two electrons in this here, and uh, you can use the, the interaction, the exchange interaction between the electrons to make kind of a, a, kind of a pseudo atom and make energy levels that work that way. I like this one, too, because the, this example of, the, of these, these, uh, these so-called uh, quantum dots in, in two-dimensional structures, because they also, people, whoops. <laughs> People talk about moving their electrons in between different locations to, to do kind of the scaling that, that, I, that we're, we're after with our atomic ions. And again, there's many groups working on this uh, throughout the world. So let me say, uh, I, one, one of the things, that, a, a little bit different than quantum computing, but certainly a, a, you know, closely related to that is the idea to perform simulation, and actually it was I think Feynman gets the, the credit in the early 80s. He was, of course, he was worried like, about problems, you know, solving how the quarks interact in, 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 in uh, elementary particles and nuclei. But his, anyway, he was at some meeting on advanced computation, and apparently he, he, he made the suggestion, well, uh, you know, these, these many body problems, as you know, there's an exponential scaling as the particle, number of particles you're trying to handle uh, scale up in, the, in these quantum systems. And his, so his suggestion was, well, why don't you get one quantum system to, to, to simulate or emulate another? And this is the idea that many groups in, in, many, of the, in, in many of the platforms is playing on. I won't say much about this. Uh, this, uh, these our more uh, sophisticated gates actually use. Uh, we run we we 
we, we move running, standing waves over our atoms, and these uh, with optical, they make optical dipole forces which are state dependent, depend on the internal states of the ions. Anyway, the, the, the net result is that we can make a, an interaction which looks like a spin-spin a coupling, for example, like electrons in a, in a, in a, in a solid. Uh, these, are, these are the forms of gates we actually use these days. Uh, we can also add a magnetic field a, in these experiments. And this, this so-called transverse icing model has been, uh, become kind of a test bed for the performance of, of these quantum simulations. So some of the leaders in this, in this effort, I mentioned Chris Monroe, uh, ha, now has his own group at the, at the JQI in, in Maryland, and Reiner Blod and his colleague Christian Roos have done a lot of work uh, using these simulations. And just to give you a rough idea of the scale, they're, 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 net, they're, they're playing with tens of ions. And uh, you know, I, I think the, one of the interesting thresholds to cross is that up until now, they've been able to simulate on a classical computer doing a heavy calculation. Uh, they can simulate how their experiments should work. But at around this number of 30 to 40, quantum bits that they, 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 they're getting to the point now where you can't, the computation becomes so complicated on a classical computer uh, that you can't simulate it, the, the results of the experiments. And so this is kind of an interesting plateau to reach. Uh, I think you know, there's this word floating, or this term floating around called quantum supremacy where you get to, get to manipulations uh, where you, uh, you, know, you can no longer <laughs> simulate the, the same kind of thing on a classical computer. And of course, the really interesting, oh, I should just mention in, in our group, John Bollinger, he uses a different, ah. I need a separate laser pointer, I guess. He uses a, a, a different kind of trap, but he can make two-dimensional arrays uh, of, these, of these ions rather than a linear array in, in these experiments here. Uh, and anyway, this, this gives a, this broadens the possibilities of these simulations, and he can, he can play with up to hundreds of ions in these, in these structures. Um, oh, anyway, what I, what I, what I want to say is this: so I think, uh, uh, you know, that a lot of labs are trying to, to implement this, this idea of simulation, and just to, to give you an idea where we hope things are going in the future. Uh, so we, so mainly because starting with Shor's algorithm, there's a big impetus to try to implement these ideas of a, uh, of a quantum computer, maybe ultimately uh, coming, being able to implement Shor's algorithm. So that, I, you know, to, to, to give you an idea where we're at, we're still at a very crude stage, I would say. For example, the, I think the ions by a little bit hold the record on the, on the errors in the gates, so they're, they're now the two, the, the, the single bit rotations, we can get very small errors there, but the trick is to get low errors in these two bit operations, quantum bit operations. And the level now is at about, a, there's about an error for every thousand operations. Uh, and we really want to get to do anything interesting of larger sizes. We would like to get these fundamental gate uh, errors down to at least another order of magnitude. And, and there's a, everybody's platform has all sorts of dirty problems that we're working to get rid of. One of ours is <coughs> easy to, to say, and that is we, uh, for example, we, we have to worry about heating. I mentioned that we want to freeze out the ions and then we, in, the, in their ground state of motion, and then we do these manipulations. But in the background, uh, it turns out from the electrodes, there's some electric field noise uh, which heats the ions and then compromises these these state manipulations. We don't know that we, we're sure it comes from the electrodes. And just to give you, a, we're getting a hint of what happens. We always suspected it was something on the surface. We can use simple uh, surface uh, uh, processing techniques, uh, you know, for example, using argon ion beams to scour the electrodes. And we've seen a factor of 100 reduction in this, in this heating. So we know what it's about, but we want to try to find the fundamental causes. Uh, and I haven't talked at all about error correction for large problems. There's a way to, to do more complicated encoding of quantum bits to realize error correction. That's an interesting subject by itself, and I won't, 
but that has to be done for large problems. So what about the factoring machine? And I think it's certainly the, the problem that got things going and still uh, you know, pro provides a lot of support for the field, but I think the, the factoring problem, at least on a used to useful cryptographic scale, you know, where, for, where the, the, uh, you know, the encoding or the encryption is done with, you know, several hundred bit num uh, several hundred digit numbers. I think that's the hardest problem anybody's thought of so far. So, I, I you know, it could be a situation that someday maybe we'll get make this quantum computer to to beat these, you know, these the or be able to crack these codes. But, you know, the the cryptographers are smart guys. They're thinking of codes now, coming up with codes that, as far as people know, wouldn't be cracked by a quantum computer. Anyway, so I think a lot of us feel the real application in the long term is going to be simulation. I gave this this uh, example here, uh, with a straightforward quantum computer, we might be able to do the this series of gates that that would implement Shor's algorithm, and some simple demonstrations have been done in Reiner Blot's group. Uh, I'll give you, in metrology, uh, there's, there's other applications in metrology. I'll give you just one example. Okay. And that is uh, one of our favorite ions for clocks now is based on aluminum. Uh, so the idea would be very much similar. We could detect transitions in aluminum maybe very similarly to the way we with, did with mercury. We could shine a laser on a, on a strongly allowed transition uh, unfortunately, we don't have this laser, and it's very hard to get to these very short wavelengths. So one of the, just to give you an idea of what we do is we, we, put our, we put our clock ion and we put it in with, uh, simultaneously uh, with some other ion, in this case magnesium, and that as part of that simple mapping step that I showed you earlier, we can, what we can do to detect this transition here is we can, when we drive the transition, we generally make a superposition. We can map the superposition on the, onto a motional mode of, of these two ions and then map that onto our magnesium ion, which it turns out we can more easily detect. We can get wavelengths at 280 nanometers a lot easier. And there's some other advantages about this, which I won't go through, and also since running out of time, it, it, this idea has now been extended to molecular ion spectroscopy where we, we, we don't need to, we could have a whole host of different ions where this technique, technique might be applied uh, to, uh, to, 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 real, to, to do this so-called quantum logic spectroscopy. Um, let me just mention that there's also commercial interest in this now. Uh, and I think, you know, I think these, with these, the idea of these companies jumping in is, that I think people maybe don't know exactly what the applications might be, but they, they want to be ready with this technology. So there's commercial companies now making very small quantum computers that you can still simulate with a classical computer, but get, to get people to use to the technology. And that, uh, that those, the, uh, some of these things are discussed in this website here. And of course, maybe just like the laser, we don't know. Um, we have these ideas now how this, how this might be applied, but the, probably there's, we hope there's, there's ideas that we just haven't thought of yet, which will maybe be the real applications in the future. Let me just come back to very quickly to the, this Schrodinger's cat. We can make states like this where it's an equal superposition of all the, the qubits being in the ground state and, and in the excited state at the same time. And uh, we could imagine in our experiments, we could do this on a small scale now. Uh, we could separate off one of these ions and then have a group of ions uh, uh, put in another location, and we could actually think about measuring. Uh, or it turns out these these states of the ions are they're also they have magnetic. They behave like little magnets. So, in fact, if we can make the number of bits large enough, uh, this gives this is more like a classical magnet mag magnetization, which we could measure, say with a little compass or something. And uh, that we would say that we would argue this is very much like Schrodinger's cat in the sense that. We, we, we've entangled a, one of our quantum bits, which is a much more macroscopic system, like the cat. So the, uh, the single bit over here is like the radioactive particle, the larger group is like the cat, and this classical meter is, in Schrodinger's cases, when we open the box and see where the cat is dead or alive. 
so with that, I'd like to conclude, of course, as usual in all, all, all these research groups and uh, work is done by many people are, this picture is a little out of date, but it gives you an idea the size of our group. And just as Bill Phillips said, I, I want to thank uh, Catherine Gebby, who was our, our uh, laboratory director for during most of the time that the work we've done was done. And she was a great leader and we miss her. Miss her. <laughs> so with that, thanks. Wait, Bill, you know that all this stuff. <laughs> so, uh, I, David, a question here. Um, you talked about all the experimental effort in towards quantum computing. Could you say a little bit about parallel effort by um, computer scientists or, or theorists to develop the theoretical uh, tools, I mean, to continue beyond Shor's algorithm, which seems a somewhat limited application? Yeah. I. I, I can't say very much, <laughs> I'm afraid. Certainly they're, they're, you know, they're trying to, I mean, there's many examples they're trying, they try to optimize, streamline the factoring code, for example. And they're thinking of other ways to apply this. There's certainly uh, in, you know, one of the potential applications is in quantum communication. So they're thinking of ways to streamline those ideas. And I, I, as I say, it's a, a little bit of a cop out. I, 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 I don't know a lot of what's going on. And, one of the reasons one of the reasons is it is 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 a bit of a cheap answer but it turns out that probably within a year of Schor's algorithm the, the theorists gave us enough to do for the next 30 years. <laughs> we're still trying to give it, work out you know improve be able to carry out the experiments they were suggesting so i apologize for that answer but it, certainly there's a lot of theoretical effort going on in parallel okay bill <laughs> Well, first, I'll just make a comment on uh, Mark's question. Uh, of course, as you probably know, there's a number of other algorithms that are quantum advantage algorithms. It's just that nobody cares about them uh, uh, the way they do about Shor's algorithm. On the other hand, at, uh, at the at, uh, University of Maryland, we've got this new operation called Quix, which is actually trying to bring together computer scientists and uh, quantum computing physicists to address just the kind of thing that you're, uh, you're talking about. So we're trying. Um, uh, so my, my question uh, for Dave is, um, you showed us that beautiful uh, lithographically uh, produced uh, surface trap. Now my recollection is that in the early days of surface traps, uh, there were a lot of problems. The surface traps were weak. It was really hard to move the ions around uh, corners. Uh, so what was the magic? <laughs> Uh, well, we're, the, the thing, systems are still pretty crude, right? We, you know, we do, in this idea of scaling up by moving ions around, we, we spend a fair amount, we and other labs spend a fair amount of time to control the fields so that when we move the ions, they don't heat up too much. And uh, so I would say it's, it's an adiabatic process. We, there wasn't any big step that we took to try to, to be able to scale up. And it's, yeah, th this problem of moving the ions around is very, you know, classical in a lot of ways. So we don't need the the, the goal is to try to move ions around quickly without heating them, uh, and that that's a yeah. so that's just an better issue. and better engineering all. Yeah, yeah, we, I, yeah. we think so. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's uh, very interesting that what your talk, but uh, you mentioned very briefly error correction, and you are trying to improve the samples the quality to eliminate the errors. Are you using or you think of using eventually Ancilla qubits? I didn't hear the last. Ancilla qubits. Sorry? Oh, uh, well, we, we, we're, playing, <laughs> we're playing with, silicon's not a very good atom for, for these atomic no, ion no, experiments. No, I asked you about error correction. There are these protocols that use Ancilla yeah. qubits. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I mean, we, I mean, we and other groups have done the simple demonstrations of error correction protocols. And the, the name of the game is, is, as I mentioned, what we need to reduce the errors. And, uh, you know, as I say, we're at about 10 minus 3 level now, and we need to do at least an order of magnitude before, I think, better before we can do serious error correction. So. Thank you. Yeah. 
And I would like to ask uh, two questions. One is, uh, an, according the, uh, in, in comparison with the first lecture in uh, our event, uh, you are working on very high temperatures. But uh, on what is possibilities to go to more normal question, uh, temperatures uh, for standard elect electronics? And other question, if it is some uh, evaluation, uh, estimation, what kind of best, uh, smallest error can be achieved when you will work uh, in a quantum computer with big numbers? Well, okay, to answer your first question about temperature, actually a lot, certainly our early so experience. So in the first uh, lecture it was a uh, uh, discussion about nano-Kelvin and uh, pico-Kelvin, so that uh, you present it as uh, millikelvin temperature experiments. Yeah. So that it's very high temperature in comparison of the first lecture. Well, wait, but, wait, wait. but from other side, uh, when, uh, this uh, one millikelvin temperature, as for me, a solid state uh, physics, it's, uh, also it's too low. And I would like to have devices which would be work on yeah. higher temperatures. So that what the highest temperature you predict for quantum computer? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, one thing to say about temperature is that the millikelvin won't work for us. That's why I say we had to do the second step where we put the, the, the ions in the ground state of motion. And that what we th the way we usually think when these quantum computing problems is we, we are able to start the atom in the ground states of motion. And so what we think about rather than temperature, we think what's the probability the atom gets excited by one quantum of motion? So at that point, we stopped thinking about temperature. Uh, more generally, though, we, you know, we, these, temp these experiments are at room temperature, but we, we, we now have experiments where we're operating at liquid helium to, to reduce the overall heating effects from the outside world. But I mean, this, this, is, a, this is a problem. Okay. So. Thank you very yeah. much indeed. Um, and thank you for the questions. I think we need to allow Itamar to set up, but um, that, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you.